Uh, my wife Annie and I, we have uh, two children. They're both in college now. And um, our story is uh, too long, so I'm going to make it very quick. Uh, got involved in a church plant around 1990 and 89, somewhere around that time. And uh, got really involved in that. In 92, went on to plant a church as the lead planter. And by 97, seven years into it, both of those had folded <laughs> and uh, finished it up. And uh, when, you know, when things fall apart, what do you do? You go teach in a Bible school. <laughs> so we went... Um, We went to India and uh, started teaching in a Bible school. Didn't want to pastor anymore. Didn't want to uh, plant a church or do any of that at all. And um, so we pursued that. And uh, uh, you know, about two months later, uh, I got bored. You know, from the age of 14, 15, I'm used to in the streets of New York, handing out stra- tracts, sharing the gospel, uh, just preaching on street corners. We would just jump on top of park benches preaching, and uh, I don't know what I preached, but remember people came to the Lord, and uh, I still remember that, and I had them stand right there on the asphalt, have them kneel down right there, we'd pray for them. Um, you know, with that background, going to a seminary and just teaching in a very sterile atmosphere uh, got old real quick, and uh, so about two or three months later, I got bored, and we started looking for places to reach out and started small groups in some uh, secular colleges in the area. Uh, Next thing I knew, it was starting to look like a church. And I'm like, Lord, (laughs) I didn't do this. It's not my fault. I didn't mean to do this. uh, But it just turned out to be a church plant unintentionally. And now out of that church, uh, we've planted about five churches. And uh, we have about uh, seven places identified uh, and we are beginning things uh, just in our state and uh, in a nearby state as well uh, to plant. And, um, and so that process is going on. So that's, what's, that's a little bit about us and uh, Asia, India. And I want to give a special thanks to the uh, missions leadership team. Uh, specifically, I'll just say three things. And, and there's just not just me, but, uh, but other Asian leaders, specifically the Indian leaders, they felt. One is that we've sensed a really great sense of belonging to the rest of the vineyard. And uh, it's very important for us. It's highly valuable for us. And the other thing is personal connections. You know, uh, we got to connect with so many people. For Asians, it's, uh, it's an unusual thing, you know, for you to be connected with people uh, that are of stature. And, I mean, you know, we don't think of those things, you know. We're, for us, everybody is just uh, our friends, our brothers, our buddies, you know. But for Asians, that's a big deal. And, uh, and to even think of that, it's a great thing. And the third thing, soul care, leader care has been fabulous for us. I personally have been immensely blessed and my life transformed uh, uh, on, a, on a road, you know, th- th- it put me on a road toward complete renewal and um, uh, healing as well of a 17-year-long back pain. Um, anyway, I'll share about that toward the end. Uh, intentionality, plenty of tensions. <laughs> Uh, lots of tensions, and uh, how do we deal with all these tensions, right? Uh, Vineyard India, we, uh, I, I think uh, Ross shared a little bit about us, but we have four regions. We've divided up into four regions, about 22 churches right now. And, uh, uh, and out of that, in the next 10 years, we have a goal of planting 55 churches within the next 10 years. And right now, and, I, and, I, and it looks like we'll exceed that, and we're praying that we will exceed that quickly. Uh, Right now, we have about 13 areas identified for church plants uh, in different places, and it's already in progress. Many of them are already in progress at different levels. And uh, and we find a nice cohesiveness among the leaders. Uh, The connections are there among the churches. Uh, These leaders, they go back and forth and visit all the different churches. The pastors go back and forth. Uh, Regionally, there are gatherings for pastors. Uh, Really, I see a lot of healthy things there, so... 
pray for us. And uh, if anybody is interested in the uh, India partnership, make sure you see Brad Bailey. Brad's here. And um, anyway, yeah, he's back there. So please see Brad as well. So talking about intentionality, I want to just share with you uh, a few things about some of the struggles that we experience, some of the tensions that we experience. And for me, it's a dual thing because I grew up here. I grew up in New York City, and my experience has been here. But in the last 18 to 19 years, I've been in the struggle of trying to relate to a nation that is really my own nation, and, uh, but having to go back there and try to figure out who I am and uh, for them trying to figure out who I am, uh, and I don't think uh, we figured that out yet. But my daughter is studying psychology, and I told her, once you finish, maybe she can figure me out. <laughs> I hope so. But I think our challenges are really unique. Uh, I'll just name them off and just share with you just highlights of some of those things, because you guys are all, all of you, are practitioners, and you think in these ways, so I'm just going to share these points with you. One is a very important area for us. It's the area of social connections. You know, I find that those who are less educated, I won't say that they have more social connections, maybe they do, but those who are less educated, I find that they are better at using their social connections to share the faith. See, those who are more educated, uh, the more wealthier ones, and they are professionals, and they have lots of relationships as well, but they're professional in nature. And those professional relationships often just stay as a professional relationship, and they have a hard time bringing in the issues of faith there, because they feel like they're infringing on that professional level of connections. But then, those who are less educated, those who are poorer, it seems that they connect very well in, uh, in, in, in their relationships in that way. And, uh, and the others are less flexible in sharing their faith. Issues of leadership, big issue for us. But one thing that I find is an area of social strata. Uh, and in, in India, it's a major issue. Social status, social strata. As soon as I walk into a room or as soon as you walk into a room, immediately you're just kind of placing yourself at different levels, at the people that you see, where do I fit, where is this person, who is lower, who is higher, and the way you greet somebody, the way you talk to somebody, it's all related to that, and it's heavy, and it's intense, and that's what the area that I struggled with for the first few years, trying to figure this out, because I never thought of those things. I just go in and say, hi, <laughs> but you, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but, you know, I find that... Um, all strata of society, they're all capable of leadership in their own level. And so we want to raise people into leadership of all strata. We want everybody to become leaders. Sure, they can become leaders. But I also find that there are some issues that are difficult for us to deal with because, see, those who are of a higher strata, they would have difficulty following somebody from a lower strata. Now, those who are of a lower strata may not have so much difficulty following someone of a higher strata. If they had a choice, they wouldn't. But not normally, they would. It just seems to be the case. Okay? Uh, but, they, but the other way, it won't work. So what does this mean? Well, in our church, we have small groups. We call them care cells. And uh, these small group leaders can be from all different strata or all types. And uh, who's going to attend these groups? We want it to be anybody and everybody, but it doesn't work that way. And so what do you do? And what about the implications for church planting? Because I'm really passionate about church planting. Man, I want to plant much more than the numbers that we, have, we are praying for. I really want to. But, you know... Some of the people that I have in my mind, in my heart, that I feel that are, that are going to be planters may not be acceptable to a lot of people. So what do I do? So do I say, okay, you can be a church planter, but only if you are of, well, I can't do that. They're all God's people. 
I don't have an answer for that. But I know that I need to send them out. Well, I'll send them out. But what's going to happen? Not sure. But those struggles are there and those struggles are real. And when it works out, it's a difficulty, it's a painful thing when they realize that, you know, only certain people show up. And people look at me and say, well, Alexi, you, you, you know, the, you're, you can do this because you grew up in America. Or you can do this because you're from such and such of a status or strata of society. Painful, difficult. I wish those things didn't exist, but that just seems to be the reality. So working in a, in a nation like India, what do you do? Another one is a gender challenge. Women leadership seems to be less accepted in a male-dominant society. But then I used to always ask people this question, especially I used to ask my father this question. How is it that you have India as a male-dominant country and then Indira Gandhi, a lady, was a prime minister for so long and we have women leaders all over the nation, but then it's a male-dominant country yet. Doesn't make sense, does it? Doesn't to me either. And if you ask your average Indian, they'll just kind of put their hands like this also. No answer for this. Now, what about church? You know, we found that some of our best cell leaders are women. Best by what? <laughs> Best by what measure? Well, these are the ones that are most consistent. These are the ones that are most, um, uh, they, they do the best outreach. They've developed the, the best leaders. And uh, these are the ones that have multiplied. The others just kind of stayed there, stale or shriveled up. And the women have been some of our best leaders. But then in that area, I've faced a lot of tensions. There were people that came up to me. They were upset, angry. You know, why are all these cell groups led by women? I said, that's, that's who are leading them. Why? Well, I'm not sure I have an answer for you. Um, and then the question was, well, why don't you get some men to lead? I said, well, uh, i tell you what. Why don't you find some men to lead? And then he immediately said, where am I going to find some men to lead? And I responded to him and said, where, where am I going to find men to lead either? They just weren't. And the women that we had, they've done a great job. In a pastoral role, my wife has been well accepted there. But then there's a difference also. We are like parents to this church. Many of these people there, they gave their hearts to the Lord there. And that has other implications for church planting as well that makes it difficult too. Because a lot of the church planters we send out, they're like our children as well. But then what about women being a senior pastor? I don't know. Not sure what that would look like in Kerala. Maybe we'll try that one of these days. I don't have all those answers. But these are, you know, but in, in Kerala that would be unthinkable. In other states, maybe. Definitely in the cities, it can, it can happen even right now. But I'm not sure what would happen in Kerala for something like that. You know, in the area of training, here's another issue that we deal with. And, and as I share these things, maybe, maybe some of you can relate with the areas that you're working in, with the leaders that you're working with. There might be some similar things, or it's, might, maybe it's quite different from where, where you're working also. I don't know. Maybe a lot of similarity, though. Training leaders. You know, I believe that everybody ought to be trained to be a leader. And they'll grow in their, in their level of leadership. But I find that some people have better organizational skills. And so, who are the ones who are to be leaders of leaders? Some have better social skills. So, who do you appoint? Well, a nation like India, and mostly Asian nations as well, its longevity, its seniority, its age. Well, I've been here the longest, so I need to be the main guy here. I need to be the one in authority. 
It doesn't matter if somebody who is younger and somebody who is uh, newer in leadership maybe has better giftings than I do uh, for leadership. Maybe they have some better ability to organize. It doesn't matter. I'm the senior person. I'm the leader. What do you deal with this? How do you handle this? And in developing leaders, another big struggle we deal with is brain drain. Nobody wants to stay. Especially our state, nobody wants to stay. There's hardly any industry. Whatever industry was left, they're moving out. Nobody wants to stay. And the aim is get out of Kerala. And then the next step, as quickly as possible, get out of India. You know, when my father was uh, uh, dealing with um, kidney trouble, our nephrologist, we had to go almost an hour and a half to two hours away uh, to treat my father. And he was not well, and it was a rough ride taking him every time. And uh, we come back, and he is just, you know, he's, he's in bed for an extra day just from the, from the travel. And I remember the nephrologist saying, you know, in our state, it's a very small state on the southern part of, on the southern tip of India, we have 42 million people in that state. A tiny little strip of land on the, on the bottom of India. 42 million people. And for 42 million people, there are 15 nephrologists. And Kerala is an aging population as well. Because all the young people leave for work for, in other places. So, 15 nephrologists. You know, we have lots of hospitals, but we struggle to find a good doctor. When my mother was dealing with cancer, I used to drive four to four and a half hours one way to take her to the hospital. One time she needed a blood transfusion, and the only place I could find some blood was more than four hours away. I finally got there. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and waiting, and I'm, I keep go asking, oh, they're getting it ready, they're getting it ready. And I'm like, it's been more than an hour, you're getting it ready, this, I need this. And not only that, it takes me four hours to get, they're getting it ready. And then finally, you know what I found out? They said, oh, we put some water in the fridge or in the freezer so to make ice. So, you know, once we have the ice, you know, then, we can have, you can, then you can take the ice and the blood and go. I'm like, <laughs> they're waiting for the, uh, the water to turn into ice so I can take this. I said, just give it to me. Let me go. I just said this to say, you know, we have... So many hospitals, and we produce so many doctors, and many of you, you know, some of you are doctors, might be Indians, right? We produce so many doctors, but we don't have any good doctors. Because as soon as they get some experience, they get some practice, they leave the country. Now, getting into ministry, pastors, people in ministry, Bible schools, students, it's painful for me, very painful. For me, I've given my life to training, and uh, within a few years after many of them graduate, uh, within a few years, sometimes 50% or more leave the country. Within 50% 50, 50 within just a few years. Where are they? United States, UK, Australia, or anywhere other than India. It's painful because, well, I don't mind. I, you know, you can go wherever you want. But I wish they went, would go somewhere else and get some education rather than coming to a Bible school. Because I, I feel like the effort and the, uh, you know, the time and the energy we put into training, you know, my wife and I, we leave our home at 7.30 in the morning. We're there till 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening every day, Monday through Friday, and the church stuff after that. And whatever church planting and coaching of, ch uh, of planters and all that happens after that. And sometimes in between, we have some flexibility. So of all that effort, I'm thinking, man, I, I want to see some leaders for India. <coughs> I, 
I have no problem with people leaving, but, but I'd like to see some people stay. It's difficult, it's painful, but it's part of training leaders. It's just a reality of working in a country like that. Uh, but many of them are, are right here in the U.S. I can travel all over the place, and the, my students are everywhere, all over the state, all over the United States. My students are here. Anyway, <laughs> uh, another issue is uh, the issue of mentoring and discipling, which I struggle with because, uh, you know, you're dealing with a different culture. And I was remembering a young man who was a, a bass player. Uh, he played guitar and he, did, he was a great musician. And the only problem was if the service starts at 9 o'clock, exactly 9 o'clock he would walk in the door. I'm like, man, please, you know, maybe you can come in like 10 minutes before and plug everything in, you know, and uh, he just listens to everything, comes in through one ear, goes out the other every week, next week, same thing again, exactly 9 o'clock, the door opens, he comes in, you know, he's right on time, you know, and uh, after uh, over and over and over uh, sharing this with him, and he finally told me, he says, pastor, this is not how, this is not how you're supposed to do this. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're supposed to scold me. Scold you? Yeah, you're supposed to scold me. You can't be doing this. I said, well, I, I don't know. I've just, that's just not my style. <laughs> I've not done that kind of a mentoring or that, that kind of a disciplining. That's not what I know. But he said, that's what you're supposed to do. So what do you do when, you know, this parent-child relationship, you know, we talk about that. We want, uh, we want an equal type of footing. We want an equal type of relationship. But what do you do when the society is set up like that and the people expect that and the people want that? I was remembering uh, Donald Trump's uh, statement years ago. I read his book and he said, some people need to be yelled at, he said. <laughs> and... I, and and once in a while when I'm driving, once in a while when we're doing stuff, you know, I turn around to my wife and tell her, you know what, I, I think Donald Trump is right. Some people need to be yelled at. <laughs> oh, and they want to be, as I, it seems. I, I remember I was driving one time, and, uh, and there was this funeral proce procession, and all these people were walking, and, uh, and, and I'm politely just kind of waiting right behind it. It's a funeral. People are walking, you know, there's, they're carrying this casket, and I'm behind them, and I'm waiting patiently, you know. And, then, and the person that, uh, that I was right behind who was walking, he turned around and saw the car, and he comes over, he's yelling at me. Why don't you honk? He tells me. And I'm trying to be polite. It's a funeral. Uh, he's yelling at me, literally yelling at me. He's getting mad. Why don't you honk? Okay. Uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> but in spite of all that, we just keep uh, reaching people for the Lord and keep training people, keep planting churches, and just go on. It'll happen. You know, we've got to develop healthy relationships, meaningful relationships, understanding relationships among leaders, among people in churches, among pastors, Difficult, because we have a country, every state has its own language, its own culture. It's like going from one state to the next, everything is different. And so when we sit together and we talk and discuss about different things, we're talking in English, but who knows what the other person is hearing and understanding who knows what we're communicating? And we think we're communicating, and we're doing pretty good, actually. We re really are. <laughs> we're really pre doing pretty good. I'm happy about uh, the experience that we have. But still, I know the difficulties in trying to communicate in a situation like this. But in leadership, we need some good relationships, and we got to do the best we can. then there's a huge theological tension. It's not one theological tension, but it's just a general theological tension in a country like ours. People want absolutes. 
You know, it's either this or that. And we want to just make sure and have everything figured out. And then once in a while, people will, you know, email me or message me on Facebook or something, you know. And, and, uh, and they want me to, you know, respond. And they say, you know, what is the right answer for this? What is the biblical answer for this? Or what is God's word for this? After all, you're doctor so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, please. I'm so glad for the vineyard that um, we don't have to have it all figured out. And I'm so glad that the Lord has it all figured out. And one day we'll be there and we can hang out together and he'll let us know how things ought to be. You know, about two years ago, I told you about the... Um, uh, the Vineyard Missions, I was thanking you guys. And, and you know, uh, around 2009, 2010 was a time that something began happening within me. About two or three years, I, up to, maybe up to five years, the Lord has been doing something. Maybe a, a time of recalibrating for me. But in the last two or three years, I've been privileged to be completely shattered, broken, and brought down to nothing. Part of it due to things I've experienced growing up. Part of it due to my struggles of trying to do what I'm trying to do. Some of the struggles that I shared with you here, part of it. Part of it, my own personal issues too. Physical as well. Down to a point where the only thing that I had to look forward to was death. Lord, let me just do as much as I can, whatever I can, because this is all that I know to do. This is what I've been called to do, and this is the purpose of my life. And let me just do what I can, as long as I can, and just, when I can't, just take me away. You know, what that taught me was this one thing. I didn't sign up for a position. I didn't sign up for an adventure. I didn't sign up for anything. I signed up for Jesus. From my childhood, the only thing that I wanted was Him, and nothing else mattered. But all of this stuff gets in the way. And sometimes the expectations of people get in the way. Oh, after all, you've got this education. After all, you've got some, some status because of your family background or whatever and all different reasons or just because you grew up in America. Putting aside all of those things, I say, you know, I signed up for Jesus. But too much stuff gets in the way. You know, this evening, as we take time to, for prayer, I just want to share with you that you know what? There are many here that the Lord is already speaking to tonight that you signed up for Jesus. But then a lot of stuff got in the way. And you know, I'm thankful for the vineyard. I'm thankful that in the fullness of time, the Lord put together this group of people. It really was for me. Maybe it was for you too, and I know it was for you too. But I believe the Lord is calling us in the midst of all the stuff that gets in the way to step back and say, Lord, what was that, Lord? I'm heavily invested into education, into theology and all that. And now I step back and I say, Lord, <laughs> no, Lord, what have you got for us? I'm not, I'm not going toward anti-intellectualism or any of this. And I, I thank God, you know, the, that NIV or the ESV, whatever you hold in your hands, my God, that, that comes from 
from generations and generation after generation of biblical scholarship, it, it really, we don't throw that aside. But you know what? It's time for us to say, Lord, what is it that you called us to? And I want to step into that. Where's Luke? Luke, come on, Luke. We're...